Okay, I have to uh, get started. This is um, this is quite incredible. Hello again. This is Michael Jones. Um, I'm the um, supervisor for uh, Gene Adams, who is going to be presenting to us today. Um, I um, I hope I think Gene will be as well overwhelmed by the number of people that are joining this meeting, and there's still people um, trying to get in. As you know, there's a now with Zoom a meeting room process where the hosts have to uh, let people into the meeting. But um, at this point, it's after 1.30, and so I want to uh, go ahead and begin um, and give Jean an opportunity to present her seminar. So um, we're here for the um, PhD dissertation defense seminar for Jean Adams. Um, I'm sure all of you know Jean, but a little bit of background. Jean has been a statistician with the um, USGS Great Lakes Science Center uh, since 1995. Um, she got her bachelor's degree at Bradley and a master's degree in statistics at uh, UW-Madison in 1990, so quite a while ago. And then she's had a pretty distinguished career as a statistician um, with USGS mostly since that time. Uh, Jean is uh, about three years ago, 25 years after she got her master's degree, Jean uh, decided that um, she wanted to do something different. Um, she had just been uh, asked to, to join, I think even lead a, a new task force that the Great Lakes Fishery Commission had set up. It was called Fish Lamp. And um, Fish Lamp is about trying to reconcile evidence that's sometimes conflicting about patterns of sea lamprey abundance, wounding rates on lake trout and lake trout abundance in, in the Great Lakes. And as the Fish Lamp group began to meet, um, they sort of rapidly reached the conclusion this was going to be a big job and they were probably going to need a postdoc or, you know, some dedicated staff to work on this. And Gene pondered this for a while and said, well, maybe a way we could get this done is I could turn it into my PhD. So she approached me about three years ago, I believe, um, and um, I had recently announced that I was not taking on any more students because I, as you know, I'm getting close to retiring. Um, but there were few people in the world who I would have said yes to, but Jean was one of them, and I was delighted to, to uh, uh, add Jean to my uh, list of uh, PhD students. So she's been working with me and with the Fish Lamp Group since then, and today she is going to tell you about the work that she has been doing on her dissertation. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to let uh, I'm going to mute my microphone and go back to letting people into the meeting. And uh, uh, Jean, the floor is yours. All right, well, welcome. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is a really a uh, cool turnout, but I think it just goes to show how desperate you all are for entertainment locked in your homes. <laughs> I want to start with a, a hearty thank you to several people um, who played a key role in me getting here. So thanks to these folks that I'm about to list off. Uh, first, my mom and dad, Harry and Mel Adams. My mom died before I even had the crazy notion to get a PhD, but she would have been so excited about uh, every step along the way, not just this, this uh, finishing line here. So I'm really sorry she missed out on that. Um, Mike Hansen first hired me into what would become the U.S. Geological Survey. Roger Bertstead first roped me into working on sea lampreys. Kasha Mullet challenged me with the questions that eventually became my dissertation. Uh, Russ Strzok and Kurt Newman at the USGS and Bob Lamb, Dale Burkett, and Mike Seifkis at the Great Lakes Fishery Commission all supported me both in my leadership training and in the pursuit of this PhD, which has been just an incredible experience. And Ted Tresca provided insider information on the sea lamprey marking data. I also have to thank my sweetie, John Heinrich, who has championed my efforts every step of the way. In fact, when I moved to East Lansing for uh, the spring 2017 semester to take classes, John sent me on my way with several months worth of home cooked meals, all frozen up in a 
a giant cooler. So um, he gave me sustenance through my semester on campus. And speaking of food, I must also thank the MSU Dairy Store, which I frequented during my time on campus, um, eventually sampling all of their flavors. Finally, I thank Mike Jones for his friendship, his sage advice, and his incredibly good nature. I never knew what a harsh reviewer I was until I saw the way that Mike writes a review. He has a way of delivering pointed criticism in the kindest way imaginable, <laughs> which is pretty cool. And I thank the rest of my committee, Jim Benz, Deb McCullough, and John Detmers, for the guidance they've provided me along the way. So I'll be talking to you today about lake trout and sea lampreys in the Laurentian Great Lakes. Lake trout are native to the Great Lakes and were once quite abundant. They supported commercial fishing operations dating back to the 1800s. In the early 1900s, four to seven million pounds of lake trout were har harvested each year in the three upper Great Lakes. Sea lampreys, on the other hand, are native to the North Atlantic Ocean. They invaded the Great Lakes in the 1920s and 1930s. By the mid-1900s, lake trout populations in the Great Lakes were decimated, in part due to invasion. In response to this decimation, a treaty was struck between Canada and the United States in 1954, creating the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, whose job it was, and still is, to control sea lampreys. The Commission implemented a control program that greatly reduced sea lamprey populations in all of the Great Lakes. The graph here is for sea lamprey abundance in just in Lake Superior. And sea lamprey control continues on an annual basis. These yellow symbols are placed at the mouths of all the sea lamprey producing streams in the Great Lakes, which require treatment every three to five years. The Great Lakes Fishery Commission budget is in the ballpark of $30 million a year, much of which goes to sea lamprey control efforts in the field. And it's money well spent, helping to maintain a healthy Great Lakes fishery which contributes $7 billion to the economy every year. When sea lamprey control is relaxed, sea lampreys bounce right back, setting back fishery and ecosystem recovery by decades. So that's why you gotta stay on top of them um, and continue with the annual treatments. So it's important for the fishery managers and the Great Lakes Fishery Commission to monitor the sea lamprey population in order to keep it in check and to tailor and prioritize spending according to the needs of the fishery on each of the lakes. The success of sea lamprey control is characterized by three metrics. Number one, they have an index of abundance for sea lampreys. Every spring, adult sea lampreys are trapped as they migrate upstream to spawn. Trapping occurs on several tributary, tributaries in each lake providing a lake-wide index of sea lamprey abundance. Number two, they also have an index of abundance for lake trout, the preferred host of sea lampreys. Every year, tribes, federal agencies, the province of Ontario, and the eight Great Lakes states conduct gillnet surveys for lake trout. The efforts spent and the numbers captured provide an index of lake trout abundance. And number three, every captured lake trout is also examined for sea lamprey marks, or uh, some folks call them wounds or scars. Um, keeping track of these marks provides, uh, gives us an estimate of the marking rate, which is the number of marks per lake trout. These marks are made when a sea lamprey attacks and feeds on a host fish. Sea lampreys have a suction cup shaped mouth with rasping teeth and a sharp tongue that can pierce the muscle wall of the fish. So they're sort of the vampire of the Great Lakes. So the three metrics I just described are all interrelated. The marking rate, of course, depends on how many sea lampreys and how many lake trout are in any of the lakes. For example, 
let's say we have a lake with two sea lampreys and four lake trout. And let's say just for simplicity that each sea lamprey leaves a single mark on one lake trout. That gives us a marking rate of two marks for four lake trout or a 0.5 marking rate. Now what happens to the marking rate if lake trout abundance increases? Well, the marking rate goes down. So you've got the same number of marks, but more lake trout. So now we've got two marks for eight lake trout with a marking rate of 0.25. What happens to the marking rate if the sea lamprey abundance increases? Well, now you get not only more sea lampreys, but more of the marks that they leave. So the marking rate goes up. Now we've got a marking rate of six marks for eight lake trout, 0.75. So these are the kinds of uh, responses that we would expect in the marking rates, given the different uh, levels of abundance for sea lamprey and lake trout. But sometimes the responses that we actually see are unexpected. Recent example of this happened on Lake Erie. In 2015, sea lamprey abundance dropped and lake trout abundance uh, increased. Both of those are normally good news. Naturally, we would have expected that the marking rate would decrease, but it did not, it increased. So how often do we see inconsistencies like this? On average, it's about once every five years for each lake. Um, and I will refer to this as the inconsistency rate. So one in five years, that's a 20% inconsistency rate. These inconsistencies leave decision makers in a bind. Which metrics should they believe? How should they prioritize their control efforts? The reduced sea lampreys and the increased lake trout seem to indicate things are improving on Lake Erie, but the increased marking rate tells a different story. So that brings me to my dissertation in which I investigated three possible reasons for these occasional inconsistencies in the status metric. First, I looked at measurement error in all three metrics to see if it would affect the inconsistency rate. Second, I looked at survivor bias in the marking rate to see if this would affect the inconsistency rate. Third, I looked at the presence of an alternative host and its effect on the marking rate. I also developed stock recruitment relations for sea lampreys. I'm not going to go into detail on that chapter in this presentation, but I will just give a one slide summary. Um, all of these are aiming for publication in peer reviewed journals. So, chapter three is in press, chapter two is in review, and these two chapters will be part of the special issue in the Journal of Great Lakes Research on the Third Sea Lamprey International Symposium. And chapters one and four are in preparation. So let me go back to the stock recruitment, just a quickie summary here. I fit adult to adult stock recruitment models for sea lamprey populations in each of the Great Lakes. Initially, I had hoped to use this approach to estimate the average age of an adult sea lamprey, but the data were too noisy to pick up on that. So um, instead, I was able to quantify how lamprocyte treatment effort reduced sea lamprey recruitment and that's what I show here, where the dashed lines show um, a lower than average treatment effort and the resulting higher recruitment, and the solid lines show higher than average treatment effort and lower than average recruitment. So hopefully these models will be useful to folks either in the control program for uh, controlling the invasive sea lamprey possibly even for folks um, in Europe that are working on the conservation of native sea lampreys. So back to the three main chapters that were addressing these inconsistency questions, I'll start off uh, talking about the measurement error. So consider that example I showed before from Lake Erie. None of these metrics are known perfectly. They're all estimated with some amount of error. If the errors are small, then we are right to be scratching our heads over unexpected results. But if the errors are large, maybe the inconsistencies we see are simply due to the noise in our measurement. So I used computer simulation to see if I could uh, recreate the inconsistencies that we observe by just 
um, just using the measurement error alone. So first I fit a predator prey curve to the three status metrics and assumed that the curve was the truth. Then I estimated the measurement error in each metric and added that error to the so-called truth. And finally, I ran a thousand simulations and compared the simulated and observed inconsistency rates. So I'll start with the predator prey curve. I fit a type two functional response model to the lake trout and sea lamprey data. So on the x-axis here isn't, let me get a pointer up here, hold on. The x-axis here uh, is an index of lake trout abundance. The y-axis is the number of attacks per sea lamprey. Those of you um, who are used to dealing with sea lamprey data, take note, I am talking about attacks per sea lamprey, not per lake trout. So how many attacks does each sea lamprey make in a given year? Now, as lake trout increase, the attacks per sea lamprey also increase, but eventually they taper off um, to the point where the sea lampreys are sati satiated. You can imagine um, if back in the days when you used to go to your office, a lot of times there's one person that has a, a bowl full of Hershey's Kisses or something like that on their desk. There's really a limit to how many Hershey's Kisses you can eat, even if that bowl is bottomless. You can only stand there so long and eat so many. So that's why the curve tapers off. The equation can be written like this where A is the effective search rate and B is a ratio of the handling time to the lake trout catchability. Unfortunately, I have to include the catchability um, in this B parameter just because the lake trout is reported as a catch per unit effort and not a lake-wide population abundance. So here are the fitted type two functional response curves for each lake. The points represent actual annual observations, and the lines are the best fitting equations for each lake estimated by maximum likelihood. You can see that the line is a bit more curved for Michigan and Huron than it is for the other lakes. This may indicate that lake trout are um, easier for sea lampreys to find in those lakes. I should also note that when I fit the Lake Michigan uh, set of points just on its own, I got a crazy looking curve that looked like a straight up line to you know eight or whatever that max is, and then a hard right turn right across. Um, so in order to stabilize that, I forced Michigan and Huron to share that A parameter. And that seems like a reasonable thing to do since Michigan and Huron are openly connected via the Straits of Mackinac. Um, so I thought it was worth doing for this example. So it's these lines that I'm treating as the true relation between the lake trout and the sea lamprey attacks. Next, I estimate measurement error in each of the three status metrics. So here I show the relation between lake trout density and its standard error on the left, and lake trout density and the coefficient of variation, or CV, on the right. These estimates come from uh, 10 smaller lakes, not Great Lakes, but 10 smaller lakes in the province of Ontario, um, incidents where they had lake-wide population estimates of lake trout. So I use the average CV of 23% uh, for the measurement error for Great Lakes lake trout. And I used a similar approach for um, sea lampreys. These data come from 143 lake years of adult sea lamprey relative abundance estimates in the Great Lakes. I used the average CV of 7% for the measurement error on sea lamprey abundance. For marking rate, um, I took a little bit different approach. I used a negative binomial distribution following recommendations from Richard and Benz. These data come from 132 lake years of marking data in the Great Lakes. Unlike the lake trout and sea lamprey metrics, which have a constant CV, you can see that the CV of the marking rate actually decreases as the marking rate increases, which is kind of interesting. I won't go into it here, but it does have some 
um, potentially important implications both for um, lakes that use a, a lower marking rate as a target and also for all of the lakes as we get closer and closer to the desired low marking rates. Um, another thing that I did that I won't go into a lot of detail here is I incorporated classification error for the marking rate. Suffice it to say that when lake trout marks are examined in the field, the extent of damage and healing is also recorded, which introduces further error into the process. So I, I did attempt to account for that um, in the chapter. But altogether, it's these measurement errors that I then added to the so-called truth, those predator prey curves that I showed you before. And then for each lake, I ran a thousand simulations. I generated assumed abundances of sea lampreys and lake trout using log normal distributions with sample sizes, means, standard deviations, and first order temporal autocorrelations based on observed sample statistics. So what we actually have seen in the lakes in the recent past. And then I used the predator-prey model to predict the expected marking rate. This is the output from a single simulation with 20 to 30 years of data for all three metrics and all five lakes, where measurement error for each metric has already been added to the underlying predator-prey model. Then for each year on each lake, I tallied up the number of inconsistencies. So those cases where the marking rate with measurement error was not what we would have expected from lake trout and sea lamp abundances, which also had the measurement error. And then I repeated this a thousand times. Finally, I compared the inconsistency rates from these simulations to the inconsistency rates that we actually observe in the lakes over time. And here are the results. For each lake, when measurement error for all three metrics, sea lampreys, lake trout, and marking rates was included, these were the inconsistency rates from the simulations. The highest rates were observed in Lake Erie and Ontario, with inconsistencies a little over 2%. How does this compare to the inconsistencies we see in real life? With the exception of Lake Michigan, where we had never observed any consistency, these, these simulated rates and around about 2% and less are nowhere close to the rates uh, from 20 to 40% that we actually observe in the lakes. So measurement error alone is not the cause of the inconsistencies that we see in the status metric. That means that decision makers should continue to scrutinize further inconsistencies for possible explanations rather than just shrugging them off as an expected consequence of measurement error. What about survivor bias and marking rates? Well, first, what do I mean by survivor bias? Well, one of the tricky things about the marking rates is that we only see marks on fish that survive the attack. And we don't know how many fish died. So here's an example with 10 lake trout four of which were attacked by sea lampreys, and two of which died. That gives us an attack rate of 0.4, because four out of 10 lake trout were attacked, and a lethality rate of 50%, because two out of the four attacked lake trout died. When we net the eight surviving fish and examine them, we only see two marks. That gives us an observed marking rate of 0.25. So the question is, how well does the observed marking rate, what we see when we're capturing these fish in the net, how well does that track the true attack rate, what we don't see and what we don't know that's really going on in the lake? I used another simulation model to find out. I started with a population of a thousand lake trout and randomly sampled the length of the lake trout from observed length frequency distributions. I kept track of each individual lake trout as I moved through the simulation. I cycled through the year, one month at a time, starting in June, which is when the uh, sea lamprey attacks really start to pick up. Then I determined the sea lamprey attack rate based on the current month and the length of the lake trout. I let the attack rate vary with month 
based on Spangler et al.'s observation of Lake Whitefish and Lake Huron. Attack rates peak in the fall, corresponding to the rapid growth and gonadal development of juvenile sea lamprey's. And I also let attack rate vary with lake trout length, based on Rudder and Benz's observation of lake trout and Lake Huron. Attacks are more common on large lake trout, less common on small lake trout. And I included stochasticity using a Poisson distribution. Now I used a Poisson distribution this time instead of the negative binomial distribution that I used in the previous chapter, um, which had been recommended by Pritchard and Benz simply because um, the Poisson distribution only requires one parameter. So it made the simulation a lot easier for me to run and it should be good enough for the purposes of this, of this work. Then I used a seasonally varying lethality rate based on Swink's observation of lake trout in the laboratory. And I included stochasticity using a binomial distribution. So everything I've shown you so far was just a single simulation for the month of June. It's not even a complete simulation yet. It's just that one month. I repeat those last few steps um, for the month of July, August, September, October, November, and December, all along the way, keeping track of which lake trout were attacked, whether they survived or died from the attack. So all together, after you run through all those months, that's what a single simulation looks like for a single season of sea lamprey attacks on lake trout. Then I repeated this for 15 different peaks of the seasonal attack rate ranging from 0.05 to 0.52 attacks per lake trout. I chose this range to span from the minimum observed marking rate to twice the maximum observed marking rate because I know that the attack rate is higher than what we observe in the marking rate due to the survival bias. I also repeated it for 15 different peaks of the seasonal lethality rate, ranging from almost zero, from 1%, lethality to 100% lethality for every attack lake trout dies. And I repeated it for 33 different length frequency distributions, each one from a different lake year. These length distributions serve as replicates in the simulation and they allow the variation not only in the length frequency distributions but also the stochasticity in those attack and lethality rates to be incorporated in the simulation. So altogether, that's over 7,000 simulations. And although I ran simulations for all possible combinations of attack rates and lethality rates, I only used the results from a subset of the simulations where the marking rates that uh, came out of the simulation were within the range actually observed during the agency surveys in the Great Lakes. This approach is termed pattern-oriented modeling, and basically it allows you to be a little sloppier when you're setting up your simulation because you know you can tidy things up at the end and still ensure that your simulation results um, you know, are, are reality-based or reflect reality more closely. So from this subset of simulations, I compared the marking rates of the surviving lake trout to the true attack rate of all of the lake trout. And the results are not very pretty. So here's the observed marking rate. This is what we would see in the field, in the net. And here's the true attack rate, which I'm only able to calculate um, in the simulation world because otherwise we don't know what's really going on. And these two were significantly correlated, but the observed marking rate only explains 7% of the variability in the true attack rate which isn't much. So what's the cause of all this variability? It's the lethality rate, which I show here um, using different colors, ranging from 0% lethality or near 0% lethality to 70% lethality. So what if I take the same graph, but break it down separately for each one of these um, lethality rates? What would it look like then? Now the correlation is much stronger. In most cases, the observed marking rate explains more than 50% of the variability in the true attack rate. 
That means if the lethality rate were constant from year to year, marking rate would be a good index of the true sea lamprey attack rate on lake trout. And this makes sense intuitively. Here's an example of a few sea lampreys, many lake trout, and a higher than expected marking rate. Why is it higher than expected? Maybe the lake trout survived sea lamprey attacks better this year than in past years. Marked lake trout that ordinarily would have died, for some reason, they managed to survive in this particular year. So more marked lake trout were observed than the next. So if lethality from year to year changes like this, then the marking rate isn't going to be a very good way to track the true attack rate. But if it stays constant from year to year, then the marking rate will be a good index of the true attack rate. So does survivor bias contribute to the inconsistencies we see in the marking rates? Maybe. It depends on how stable attack lethality is from year to year. There is certainly some evidence that lethality rates vary. Um, it varies by sea lamprey size, by lake trout size, by lake trout strain, which is important for lakes that are, have stocking programs. And it also varies with the water temperature of the lake. But there's also evidence that at least over some 10-year period, the lethality rates have been relatively constant. Um, shown a high correlation between marking rate and pool mortality in Lake Superior, and a high correlation between marking rate and dead lake trout in Lake Ontario. So the tricky part here is that it's difficult to estimate lethality in the field. It's much easier to estimate lethality in the lab, but lab estimates may not be representative of what's going on in the lake. There were some other things that I explored in this chapter as well, and I'll just describe those briefly here. Throughout this presentation, I've been focusing only on the marks that are the result of sea lamprey feeding attacks, but sometimes sea lampreys attach to a lake trout without piercing the muscle wall and feeding. In that case, they're just hitchhiking. And these marks are also recorded by fishery managers in the field. So they record the marks from feeding attacks as type A and the marks from hitchhiking attacks as type B. And really my initial thought for this chapter was that decision makers might do a better job if they track the hitchhiking marks rather than the feeding marks because presumably the hitchhiking marks would not be as lethal to the lake trout and so the survivor bias would not be as disruptive and wouldn't contribute to this inconsistencies that we see. And while it is true that the hitchhiking marks are not as affected by change in lethality rates, they are instead affected by changes in the composition of the marks. So in other words, what's the mix of type A and type B marks? Uh, we have no idea if these proportions are constant over time. So the hitchhiking marks do not offer an easy solution to the challenge of accurately tracking sea lamprey attacks. So that leaves us with a little bit of a question mark here for the second chapter. Survivor bias may be contributing to the inconsistency rates we observe, uh, but maybe not. What about the presence of an alternative host, something other than lake trout for sea lampreys to feed on? Might that be contributing to the inconsistencies we see in the marking rates? Here's an example with several sea lampreys, a few lake trout, and a lower than expected marking rate. One explanation for this lower than expected marking rate could be the presence of another species of fish that sea lampreys attack. This is what I mean by an alternative host. So I took a look at the host preference of sea lampreys in Lake Ontario, where there are not only lake trout, but also Chinook salmon pictured here. Chinooks are prized game fish and also a prime target for attack by sea lampreys. So I'm gonna walk you through how I quantified the host preference of sea lampreys. I'm only considering two species as possible hosts for sea lampreys to attack lake trout, the brown fish in the diagram, and Chinook salmon, the blue fish in the diagram. 
So let's focus on the lake trout and calculate two key quantities. First, we're going to calculate the number of lake trout as a fraction of all of the fish. So we look at all the fish, we've got eight fish total, and then we count up how many are lake trout. We've got two of them. That's two out of eight, or 0.25. Second, we'll calculate the number of lake trout as a fraction of the marked fish. So now we focus on just the marked fish. We've got four of them. And we look at how many lake trout there are. There's just one. That gives us a ratio of one out of four, or 0.25. So what does that mean for sea lamprey preference? Well, since the lake trout are equally represented in all fish and in the marked fish, that means that the sea lamprey aren't favoring one species over another. Um, they're just completely neutral. Let's look at another example. Here we've got eight fish total, and three of those are lake trout. That gives us a fraction of 0.37 for all fish. And we've got four marked fish, three of which are lake trout. That gives us a fraction of three out of four, or 0.75. So now what does that mean for sea lamprey preference? Well, in this case, lake trout make up a greater fraction of the marked fish than they do of all fish. So that indicates sea lampreys are preferentially attacking lake trout. And then one more example. Again, we've got eight fish total. One of them are lake trout. That gives us a fraction of 0.12 out of all fish. We've got four marked fish, none are lake trout. That gives us a fraction of zero. So what does that mean for sea lamprey preference? In this case, the lake trout make up a smaller fraction of the marked fish than of all the fish, indicating sea lampreys are preferentially attacking Chinook salmon. So now that you've got the general idea, let's plot these three examples as points on a graph. So the left example will be point one, the middle example point two, and the right example point three on the graph that I show next. So the x-axis here is lake trout as a fraction of all fish. The y-axis is lake trout as a fraction of marked fish. The diagonal dotted line represents where the two fractions are equal. And so that means where sea lampreys show no preference. The upper left triangle is the portion of the graph where lake trout are a greater fraction of the marked fish than they are of all fish. So that indicates their preference for lake trout. The lower right triangle is the portion of the graph where the lake trout are a smaller fraction of the marked fish than they are of all fish, indicating a preference for Chinook salmon which lines up exactly what we saw for points one, two, and three in our previous example. So now let me put real data on this same graph from Lake Ontario. Here the symbols represent annual observations from the year 2000 to 2014 in Lake Ontario. The symbol size represents the number of hosts examined for marks. So bigger circles represent a bigger sample size. Most of the symbols you can see fall above the dotted yellow line, or excuse me, the dotted line, indicating a preference for lake trout. So then I fit a model to these points using a natural log transformation of Murdoch's simple ratio predation model with the addition of a switching parameter, V. Now if the switching parameter is significantly different from one, that's going to indicate um, that sea lampreys are switching their host preference, that they're not just sticking with uh, preferring one species or the other, but they're switching back and forth. So I fit the model using a general linear model with a quasi-binomial family, which is essentially the same as a logistic regression, um, but because I have non-integer responses, I had to use that quasi-binomial family instead of binomial family. So the solid black line is the best fit to that model for these points. And the estimate for the switching parameter B was significantly different from one, indicating a host, excuse me, indicating a switch in host preference. 
Now I'm going to add um, these dashed lines, which represent the 95% confidence intervals around the curve. And we can use these to help interpret the model prediction. So where the lower um, confidence interval is greater than this dotted neutral line, we can say that sea lamp rays are for sure showing a preference for lake trout. And where the upper confidence interval dips below this dotted neutral line, we can say that sea lampreys are showing a preference for Chinook salmon. And then in the middle, where the confidence interval overlaps that dotted line, uh, the sea lampreys, we don't have enough evidence the sea lampreys are showing no preference. So in summary, when the hosts are more than one-third lake trout, sea lampreys prefer lake trout. And when the hosts are less than one eighth the lake trout, sea lampreys prefer Chinook salmon. So, relative lake trout abundance has to be pretty low for sea lampreys to switch their preference to Chinooks. Lower, in fact, than was ever observed in the 15 years included in this study. Right? The 15 years in the study range from about uh, 0.25, 0.25 percent lake trout up to 52% lake trout. So we never approached this less than one eighth lake trout um, where we would have seen um, a switch to Chinook. So this, me saying that they switched to Chinook is strictly a, an extrapolation of the model. It's not something we observed. But we did observe the switch from lake trout preference to no preference. So it's reasonable anyways to think that if they continued on this way, they would show a preference for Chinook. Now, I just want to add a little bit of emphasis to how I'm using the term preference here, and that is specifically referring to attacks on hosts that are disproportionate to host relative abundance. So that doesn't necessarily mean that sea lampreys are choosing lake trout over Chinook as if they were in a buffet line. Spatial distribution is an important factor to consider. So if sea lampreys tend to occupy the same habitat as lake trout, but a different habitat than Chinooks, then they may be more likely to attack lake trout just because lake trout are where they are. This is just like youpers are more likely to encounter and eat a pasty than they are a Coney Island hot dog because their habitat overlaps with the pasty. So I've demonstrated a strong preference of sea lampreys in the field for lake trout and evidence of switching to Chinook salmon when lake trout relative abundance is low. Now I want to bring us back to the decision makers who are puzzling over the inconsistencies in the marking rates. So here are the observed marking rates on lake trout in Lake Ontario for the 15 years in the study. The dashed horizontal line is the target marking rate of 0.02 marks per lake trout for Lake Ontario. Now, what if I keep the same number of hosts and the same number, the total number of hosts and the same number of marks, total number of marks that were observed during those 15 years, but all I do is change the species composition in the lake. So, you know, a greater percentage of lake trout or a smaller percentage of lake trout. This is what I get a wide range of predicted marking rates from the prediction model. All I did was vary the fraction of lake trout in the lake from 25% to 52% for each one of these years. And that was the range of um, species compositions that we actually observed. And the vertical range of predictions certainly looks wide enough to contribute to the inconsistencies that we observed. So marking rates are affected by the presence of alternative hosts. Another interesting thing to consider is that because sea lampreys switch to Chinook when lake trout abundance is low, the presence of Chinook salmon in Lake Ontario may be a benefit to lake trout, sort of buffering them from sea lamprey attacks um, if their numbers are quite low. And finally, this work has been accepted for publication by the Journal of Great Lakes Research and is available online now. Thanks to the folks that made it possible for me to do this particular work on sea lamprey preference, 
the folks at New York State DEC, OMNRF, and USGS who put in the hours in the field collecting valuable long-term data, and the folks at Cornell and Michigan State that worked on the lake-wide population models. With a special shout out to Kimberly Fitzpatrick for allowing me to use her not yet published Chinook salmon estimates. So to wrap up the findings of my dissertation, measurement error did not explain the rate of inconsistencies that we see in the lakes. Survivor bias may not be a problem if the lethality rate of lake trout attack by sea lampreys is relatively constant. And the presence of alternative hosts can affect the marking rates we observe on lake trout and contribute to the inconsistencies that we see in the lakes. So when I originally put this presentation together, I ended here. Um, but of course, the story never ends. <laughs> so I thought it would be worth um, answering what I thought might be a good first question would be what's next. Um, for measurement error, it would be helpful to have an alternative way to identify fish that have been attacked by sea lampreys, something other than just looking for marks on a fish, which can be difficult to find, and trying to classify the marks in terms of their severity and extent of healing, which is also quite difficult to do consistently. Uh, Tyler Ferkus's work, he's um, also a PhD student at MSU with Cheryl Murphy's lab, his work on sublethal effects of sea lamprey attacks on lake trout really shows the importance of knowing the extent of the damage done to the fish. So if we could come up with um, some quick and dirty way to really understand what's going on with that fish, you know, from a tissue sample or from a blood sample, some kind of a biomarker, that would be really beneficial. For survivor bias, um, it would be helpful to have an estimate of lethality in the field, as difficult as that might be. Uh, with advances in tagging technology, it might not be too far off before we could pull it off, um, track a lake trout, know whether it was or wasn't attacked by a sea lamprey, and know whether it lived or died. For alternative hosts, I'd like to take a look at other examples um, with other species and other lakes. This is much easier to say than it is to do because it requires lake-wide or at least region-wide um, and region-specific estimates of absolute abundance. You can't just use catch per unit effort here. And you have to have a long enough time series with enough variability to pick up on potential changes in preference. It would also be interesting to take a closer look at whether sea lamprey preference really depends on the relative abundance of lake trout, or if it simply depends on the absolute abundance of lake trout. And I didn't present the results here. I did try to look at that um, in my chapter on Lake Ontario, but I just couldn't tease out the difference because the relative and absolute abundances were so highly correlated. So thanks so much for your time. I'll let you read this little poem while I get a cough drop and drink some tea, and then I'll, I don't know, turn it over to Mike, maybe, for questions. Great. Thank you, Jean. At this point, you should be, um, nor under normal circumstances, you would be, I'm sure, experiencing a thunderous applause um, <laughs> from 162 participants in this uh, seminar other than me. So consider yourself applauded. Um, we have, a, we have a little bit of time for some questions for Jean. I think the only way to, to manage this is for folks to use the raise hand feature in the participants window um, to uh, tell us, tell Jean or I, if you have a question. I, I just can't see how we can let 162 people all unmute their microphones and start shouting. Um, <clears throat> I do have a question while people are trying to do that. I don't see any hands raised at the moment, I don't think. But I do have a question in the chat window, Gene, from Ted Castro Santos. He says, did you look into the ratio of hitchhikers versus feeding attack marks? Does that vary and how does it relate to inconsistency? <laughs> 
Yeah, so that was one of the pieces that I didn't go into detail here, Ted, but I did look at that ratio. In fact, I gamed with that, um, that ratio in my simulation. Again, kind of hoping that the, um, the hitchhiker's marks would end up being sort of like the answer, <laughs> the answer we were looking for. Um, but again, I can't, I just don't know whether it varies or not because of this highest that we have and, and seeing the marks to begin with. So even if we assume that the B marks were subject to little or no lethality, we know that the A marks are, so we're not seeing all the marks. So we don't have a good estimate of it in the field. We certainly don't know whether it varies or not. I can think of good reasons why it wouldn't vary <laughs> if you thought that um, you know, a uh, sea lamprey needed to feed on three fish before it took a rest and, and hitched a ride. One of the things I struggled about um, through all stages of this dissertation was, why the heck are there hitchhiking marks on fish? I mean, to come back to the Hershey's Kisses example, uh, I can't imagine a situation in which I would put a Hershey's Kiss up to my lips and not eat it. So these sea lampreys are attaching to fish, you know, likely for the benefit of, of uh, just having a rest and not having to swim themselves, but, but not feeding at all. And then apparently leaving that host before it fed to either feed on a different fish or maybe it was time for spawning and they left. So uh, it's a lot of puzzles behind those sea marks. I hope that answers your question. Do you, do you want to just uh, read the question out loud, Jean? <laughs> oh, right. Gavin asked, do your findings suggest... Oh. oh, sorry, Mike, am I interrupting you? No, go ahead. Okay. Gavin asked, do your findings suggest that we might better focus on improving estimates of the abundance of sea lampreys rather than marking rates as measures of the success of our efforts to control sea lampreys? Uh, the biggest question mark, I mean, my, my short answer to that, Gavin, is no, um, that we're doing a pretty darn good job. Um, the measurement error stuff anyways really points to us being in pretty good shape. I, I thought that the marking rates um, probably could span the most improvement of those three metrics, but there's one big question mark that kind of remains for the sea lamprey abundance, and that's as good of a job as we do of estimating the stream runs, um, we really don't have a way to know how well when we uh, when we just assume that these six, seven streams in each lake are an index of the entire population of the lake. We have no, we don't have any real basis to understand how um, how reasonable of a leap that is. So that would be one piece um, that would certainly benefit from further investigation, but that's not a matter of like, oh, we need better mark recaptures or we need more index streams. That's more like understanding how all these three metrics might link together or um, having an idea of community wounding or something like that. Some other way to get a notion of, um, of the real level of <laughs> So I see we have a, oh, go ahead. R.J. Burr. I think I know who that is. Roger Bergstead. Ah, okay. Do Roger. you want to speak to that? So Roger, I'll read it out. Uh, Lake, Lake Ontario during the 1980s, there were changes in sea lamprey abundance, recovery rates of dead lake trout, and Creel census estimates. Any help there to relative to lethality, question mark, also Type B wounds can turn into type A wounds, which is a major difficulty in marking assessment. Yeah, so the um, the recovery rates of the dead lake trout, I think Roger is referring to that, um, that Schneider et al. <laughs> paper where they had like this 10 year period where they showed a strong correlation. So certainly that was evidence that lethality, at least over a 10 year period, and at least in Lake Ontario, could be relatively constant which is 
um, which is a relief because it means that tracking the marking rates um, is a good idea um, and it should give us some notion of what sea lamp are doing in the lakes. To the second part, the type B wounds can turn into type A. This is something else um, that Tyler Ferkus work was really uh, instrumental in pointing out, but others have seen it too. Sean Nowicki and Mark Eigner have done previous studies where they're um, looking at, again, this is coming back to this classification of marks and whether they were feeding or hitchhiking. The cool thing about Tyler's work is that he had um, fish in the laboratory, so he knew whether uh, a sea lamprey fed on them or not right from the beginning. And then he took photos of the marks on the fish over time and could see their progression. So when Roger's saying a type B turns into a type A, that means to our eyes, to the observer eyes, um, it might look like uh, a type A to us. It might look like it was a feeding event, a feeding mark, um, but it may never have actually been a feeding mark. It might've been a hitchhiking mark that just got so, you know, infected or whatever, the tissue fell off in a way that made it look like that it was actually a, a pierced mark. Gene, we have a question from Michael Wagner. He's got his hand up. So Michael, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Sure. Hi, Gene. Hi. How are you? Thanks for your talk. I'm pretty good. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm thinking about this mismatch scenario a bit, and in particular, I'm thinking about it in context of marginal value theorem, because it seems like the, the analysis so far sort of is thinking a lot about lake trout, but sort of treating sea lamprey as, as it just sort of attacks in one way all the time. But one of the interesting things that can happen when the ratio of, say, a parasite to its host changes in the environment is that the value to the host of leaving earlier sort of detaching and going to another prey item increases as prey or host density increases, right? And so this is related to marginal value theorem, sort of when you give up feeding in a patch and begin to look for another patch based on how much energy you're getting from the patch and whether there are other good ones in the area. And so I'm wondering if you tend to see these mismatches or evidence of these switches when the ratio of uh, lake trout to sea lamprey is favorable for sea lamprey. In other words, there's just more prey in the yeah. in the environment. The consequence of that could be they depart a host early, leave a lesser wound, have less likelihood of that animal dying, and wound more individuals during a single feeding season as, you know, each parasite will wound more individuals within a single feeding season if the cost of jumping to other host is lower, which yeah. should have prey abundance is higher. That is really cool mark uh, mike uh, i didn't i didn't look at that at all um, but i think considering that or trying to take that into account would be really interesting i know when i was fitting those um type 2 functional response curves and seeing a number of them that had pretty close to a straight line relationship i was trying to understand um more about because um, if they were absolutely straight line relationships, those would be type one functional responses, which suggest that uh, they just keep feeding and feeding and feeding without getting satiated or without ever slowing down. But one of the things I read was talking about something related to what you were just mentioning, which is um, if there's no, if there's essentially no price to pay for um, handling, so-called handling of your prey item then you can have that sort of a straight line relationship. So I'm thinking if you are a sea lamprey and you're on a, attached to a lake trout and that lake trout is aggregated, say, for spawning, so you've got, you know, alternative, not alternative posts in terms of species, but you've got other fish to choose from. As soon as you see a healthier one or a bigger one, you can jump ship uh, anytime you want. Um, to get a, you know, a better prey idea. So I think that that, that would be really tough to, to, uh, to take into account, but I think that's an important measure. That sort of speaks to the difficulty of tracking these things spatially and where they're spatially aggregated, the lake trout are aggregated, and how much are they overlapping? Oh, yeah, good question. <laughs> 
Thanks. So, Gene, we have um, one, one more question before I think we need to adjourn. So, Andrew Muir has sent a question through the chat window. Chinook okay. and lake trout occupy quite different niches during much of the year. Mm -hmm. Did you examine whether there were spatial temporal differences in wounding data and how might that influence your preference results? I did not examine that, but that would be a, an excellent next step if that information were available. Um, and I think it might be, I'm not so sure if it would be in Lake Ontario, but I think it might be, um, say in Lake Huron. In fact, somebody, I can't remember who now, was it Rudder? Maybe, um, already picked up on some spatial differences um, amongst different regions in Lake Huron, which sort of indicated that my fitting a type two functional response, not just even for Lake Huron, but in to some sense, Lake Huron and Michigan combined was a, a drastic oversimplification. Um, but yeah, the, the spatial overlap um, differing during the year, that would be cool to find. It would, that would be that would be really interesting to look at um, if the if the data were there. It's tough to keep track of these things. Maybe that's another place where um, tagging technology um, would really help out because we'll have better information on those space, you know with those acoustic tags and the and the uh, the arrays. Um, maybe we'll have information like that available in a way that we really haven't in the past and be able to address stuff like that. All right, <clears throat> thanks, Gene. Thank you, the folks, for your questions. Um, uh, I, I guess I'll just wrap up by saying, um, uh, Jean gave a practice version of her defense seminar last, uh, about a week ago, as many of you do when you're getting ready for your defense. And uh, um, <clears throat> the practice seminar was really good, but boy, um, she hit it out of the park this morning, or this afternoon, uh, where I am, it's still morning. <laughs> But uh, so again, I'm sure that if we were in the right circumstances, you would be hearing a lot of people giving you a, a, a clap of um, enthusiastic. There's some really nice comments coming through on the chat window. Thank you for so many people. As Jean says, I suppose one of the explanations for the huge crowd we got out today is that people have comparatively fewer other distractions, but uh, I still think it's much more a testament to just how um, far-reaching Jean's presence is in the Great Lakes and uh, I'm sure that she like I are, are really grateful for uh, such a large audience. So thank you all for joining us. Um, brief note to John, Jim, Deb and Jean. We will exit this meeting. We will reconvene in, um, what time is it now? Let's say at uh, 1150 uh, my time or what is that 250 your time? So give us all 15 minutes for to catch our breath and get organized and you guys have the uh, link to the other meeting so we'll see you in 15 minutes okay thanks, thanks, again, Mike. Jean. thanks everybody all righty congratulations Jean. thank you